Let's talk about the coronavirus and how you can protect yourself. We'll talk to a medical expert in a moment about that. But first, for more background, let's turn to this report from this morning's Today Show, as reported by NBC's Janice Mackey Fryer. This morning, hospitals in Wuhan under-resourced and overwhelmed. People anxious about the mysterious virus that has triggered extraordinary measures across China to contain it. Hospitals appealing for supplies. State media reporting volunteers offering to help. With the number of infected people on the rise and no real end in sight. Health officials are working to pinpoint the source of the virus. Ground Zero, a market in Wuhan, where people could have eaten infected meat or fish. Authorities confirm the virus can be transmitted from human to human through coughing, sneezing, or other personal contact. At least three cities in China on total lockdown. Restrictions extended to seven more. 33 million people affected. And already confirmed cases in at least seven countries, including a man in Washington state who flew in from China last week. Around the world, airports on alert. Passengers screened for symptoms by workers in hazmat suits. While across China, anxiety over the virus is spreading rapidly on social media. Masks are selling out everywhere. Officials are racing to build a special hospital that could treat a thousand virus patients. Construction slated to finish in just six days. In Beijing, festivities for the Lunar New Year canceled. Tourist attractions closed, including Shanghai Disney and sections of the iconic Great Wall. In Wuhan, the streets eerily empty, the normally busy train station deserted, the city locked down, isolated and on edge. And here to talk more about the coronavirus is a medical doctor, Dr. Janet Neshwat. Uh, she's also a TV news correspondent and medical director of City MD. Welcome to Pittsburgh. How are you? Good morning. Very well. Thank you. All right. Uh, that report talked a lot about the virus, but really doesn't talk about how uh, we can, how we contact it. Is it something that someone near us coughs who is infected? How, how do you catch it? Sure. So it was first transmitted, Chris, from an animal to a human, and now we're seeing human to human transmission. So if someone has the coronavirus, then if they're coughing and sneezing and you're nearby, you could potentially catch it that way if those particles get into your mucous membranes, into your nose, into your mouth, um, into your lungs or into your eyes. So the best thing that we could do to help protect ourselves is, number one, keep your hands washed and clean. Hand hygiene is very important. Um, if you're coughing or sneezing, cough or sneeze into your, your elbow. Stay away from known sick contacts. Obviously, if you know someone's sick, don't go hanging around with them. If you are sick, stay home. And then it's very important to try to live a healthy lifestyle, meaning get a good, well-balanced diet because for example, fruits and vegetables, you get antioxidants, um, which could help protect you um, against infection, help keep your immune system healthy and boosted. And minor things such as exercise, get enough sleep, don't smoke, those sorts of things are ways you can help keep yourself healthy. There's no 100% way to prevent catching um, this coronavirus, but those are at least some steps that we can take. Well, that sounds like the uh, good and sage advice that we get about any kind of virus like flu. Absolutely. Uh, uh, so... Uh, it just concerns me where this originated. And I've read articles that said that this started in certain Chinese wet markets uh, where animals are actually roasted alive and then consumed by people. Uh, do you have any expertise on that area or have you heard anything about that? Yes, Chris, and you're absolutely right. We, we really should take a closer look. There's more deaths from influenza and tuberculosis and measles um, than the coronavirus in this country. But yes, it was found to be originated at a seafood animal, live animal market in Wuhan, China, um, and somehow got transmitted to a human. So that's, we don't know the exact animal that it was uh, was the source it could be a cat it could be you know a fish we, we don't know exact animal source but that's where it originally uh, was found um, in Wuhan China 
and then transferred uh, to humans. So you're absolutely right. Some of the symptoms overlap with the flu. And that's why we still have to take precaution. And, you know, we can swap you for flu to determine is this flu or is this something else. But I think uh, we shouldn't panic, but we should just be concerned and take common sense precautions. How long would it take for researchers to come up with a vaccine uh, that would prevent this like they try to do uh, when they predict what flu will affect us? Great question. There's actually a vaccine in the works now, and it's expected to be out in about two to three months. So that's very exciting. Um, even though it's going to be two to three months from now, it still can help potentially save many lives because we already have about 26 deaths and over 800 cases of the coronavirus. Um, but it's important to also understand that there are different strains of the coronavirus. Most of the strains just cause, you know, cough, sniffles, headache, congestion, runny nose. But for some people, um, it can cause what we call a viral pneumonia, and it can cause respiratory distress. And that can be very serious, especially if you have any um, underlying medical condition like asthma or diabetes or, you know, uh, pregnant women or seniors or newborn uh, people, newborn children. Um, they're probably at a higher risk, even though it can, uh, it can affect anyone. Are those populations at higher risk because they may have compromised immune systems? Yes, sir, compromised or just not a robust immune system. Um, so that's why, you know, try to keep hands washed and clean. See your doctor if you feel like you're coming down with something, if you're having the symptoms of chest pain or difficulty breathing, shortness of breath. See your doctor right away. Here in the United States, we're taking measures to be proactive and, you know, surveillance. We're targeting people coming in from other parts of the of the country, of the world, from, from China, that sort of thing, checking their temperatures, asking a history, where have you been traveling, are you having any fever, cough, runny nose, that sort of thing, and um, and trying to, you know, be proactive prevent to prevent the spread here in the United States. But we expect to see, you know, a few cases here in the United States. Um, we already have one in Seattle. There's someone potentially a suspected case in Texas and even one in Tennessee, I believe. Um, so what we're doing is trying to identify these folks and then uh, isolating them, try to confirm if they have the virus and then treating them with supportive care because there's no specific cure for this virus, but we can at least treat them with fluids and oxygen, hydration, that sort of thing. Well, we always want to err on the side of caution, but just how dangerous is this if there's only been one person uh, that has contracted it here in America? And do quarantines work? Well, I, it, it may help, yes, because remember, coughing and sneezing, airborne particles is how it spreads from person to person. And that's great that there's only one confirmed person in the United States. We want to keep that number low. Um, and it's, it's, it's not, you know, 100 percent that it's going to, that doing a quarantine will, will work, but it's definitely helpful in addition to, you know, taking common sense precautions, wearing a mask, be careful not to travel to certain parts of the of the world where we know that there's an outbreak. Um, you just have to do the best you can, and um, hopefully, you know, we don't see the numbers rise in the United States like we see them rising uh, in China day by day. Do you think that this coronavirus is new and that we have no defense against it, and therefore it it could uh, act something like that flu epidemic in in 1919 or 1920, where so many people died? I hope not. It's definitely a new virus. They, call, they called it the, the novel of coronavirus, new in China. Um, hopefully we can contain it and maintain it where it doesn't spread to this part of the, the world as it is spreading um, so rapidly in China. I mean, that's a possibility, but hopefully not. I think because of the fact that we have a vaccine in the works and we're being proactive to help prevent the spread um, and taking very strict measures um, that we can potentially prevent that from happening. That in the United States. That report uh, from Janice Mackey Freyer uh, mentioned masks being sold out, and you just mentioned masks, too. Uh, is it a good idea for us here in America to invest in masks? Do they help prevent the spread of the disease? I don't think it's necessary to wear them in the United States. If you're in China, Shanghai, Beijing, I would wear one over there. 
But I think here in the United States, the bigger concern is influenza. I'm diagnosing at least 10 cases a day of influenza A and influenza B. So that, that's more of a concern for me right now. That's more common. Pneumonia, bacterial pneumonias are more, are more common. And just regular upper respiratory infections are a lot more common than the coronavirus, uh, specifically the type that has caused these deaths in uh, China. How do these diseases jump from species to species? That's a good question. We don't know exactly how that happens. It's still under investigation to even determine the exact source of where this virus first originated from. We're not sure the exact source. We do believe it's from an animal market. Um, and what happens is, Chris, the viruses already exist, but they mutate. They mutate, the, and they then we develop we don't develop, but they mutate, and then we see these new uh, strains that are created. So um, the exact source, we don't know, but we do have the power and the tools to help fight it and to create a vaccine, which is what's hopefully in the works and will come out soon to save lives. You mentioned the mutation of, of, of these various diseases. I read a book once called The Red Queen that said the only way that we stay ahead of these mutations is, is by uh, the intermarrying that we do, uh, that one person from one area from another area marries someone else, the genes are all mixed yeah. up, and the viruses have to mutate once again, uh, and we stay just ahead of them. Is, is there any kind of evidence that, that we won't stay ahead of them, that they're mutating faster than, than we are intermarrying and the genes uh, can be overtaken by the mutations and, and it would cause vast pestilence and death throughout the world like the Black Plagues? I mean, there is a concern. We already have what's called the superbug antibiotic resistance where we're, we have um, bacteria and fungus than the normal, typical antibiotics and antifungals, for example, that we normally use to treat aren't working. So that is definitely a concern. But, you know, new drugs are being developed at the NIH and, you know, pharmaceutical companies are trying to be one step ahead to try to create new medicines to help tackle these issues. But it's definitely a, a concern, absolutely. You work with uh, various disease populations. How do you protect yourself? <laughs> yes, you know what, especially in flu season, I'm always, I wash my hands about 50 times a day, going before and after every patient, I wear gloves and I wear a mask. Um, and that helps, I would say, 80 to 90 percent of the time, but I still have caught the flu once or twice over the, the past few years. You get a flu shot every year? Yes, sir, I sure do, every year, and I hope you do, do too. Well, I got one this year, but only because I'm entering one of those populations that's older and, and my immune system may not be as robust as it was. Uh, but uh, I, I know it's difficult to stay ahead of this uh, in the planning and planning what flu is going to affect us. And, and that's the hard part of changing this. What do you say to people who are concerned about vaccines, the mercury in them, uh, the, the fears of autism and those kinds of things, uh, uh, and whether or not they should have their children vaccinated? Sure, sure. Well, it's very important to understand that vaccines literally save lives. They prevent thousands and thousands of deaths. And if you look around, you don't see people limping anymore from polio. The, the numbers of deaths from meningitis have gone down tremendously. And that's because of vaccinations. Um, also, the measles death rate, even though we saw a spike recently, um, it has saved thousands and thousands of lives. So it's important to understand that vaccines save lives. And for example, the flu shot, some people might say, oh, well, it has mercury in it. No, they, they make flu shots now that are uh, thimerosal free, that don't have those additives and preservatives. And there is no data and no studies that show that these vaccines are linked to autism. That's completely untrue. Now, you can definitely have side effects from vaccines. That's normal. That's common. Um, but ultimately, they save lives. And even for the flu, even if you catch the flu, even though you had the flu shot, your symptoms are a lot less severe than they could be because the flu shot doesn't tackle every single strain of the flu. Um, what the CDC does is try to target what they think would be the most common strains. And sometimes they get it. 
Um, sometimes they don't, but it always can be helpful. Um, and I've noticed in my practice that even when I have patients that got the flu shot and they still come down with the flu, their symptoms aren't as bad as my patients who did not get the flu shot. I noticed a huge difference. Um, for example, the pa my patients that don't that didn't get their flu shot, they come in with high fevers of 102, 103 where the patients that did get it, that still catch the flu, you know, mild sniffles, cold, body aches, but not nearly as bad as those who um, haven't had their flu shot. All right, Dr. Janet Neshwat, thank you very much for your time and your expertise. Our audience is now forewarned. <laughs> All right, thank you, Chris. All right, take care. I'm Chris Moore. Our program will continue in just a moment. I hope you'll stay with us.